Krista, should I begin? Yes, you can begin, Ali. Oh, okay. Good morning, good evening, good night, and uh, a warm welcome to all our viewers and listeners, uh, wherever I are, you are on, on the globe. It's a great pleasure to open uh, the second session in our webinar series on Israel after the Afghanistan crisis, the new geopolitics of the Middle East. Uh, I'm Eli Refes. Uh, I'm the Crown Visiting Professor uh, of Israel Studies at Northwestern. I'm also the director of IIP, the Israel Innovation Project, and the Israeli Asian uh, with the Vice President for International Relations at Northwestern. IIP focuses mostly on technical, technological and scientific collaboration between Northwestern and uh, Israeli University, but we are definitely very interested uh, also in Israeli politics, Israeli society. So as I said, this is the second session uh, in our mini series. Uh, I should add uh, um, that those who missed uh, or registered and weren't able to attend the first session on Islam uh, can watch the full recording, which is now available on uh, our website and on YouTube. I'm particularly uh, glad and happy to make the opening remarks uh, in this present session, uh, as it remarkably and singularly reflects the ongoing collaboration uh, that we have established with our partner university in Israel, Tel Aviv University. Today's event is moderated by uh, Professor Itai Senet, who I'll introduce in a minute. He's the Dean of Tel Aviv University's uh, Faculty of Social Sciences. And one of the participants is Professor Eyal Zisser, the Vice Rector of Tel Aviv University. And our additional uh, TAUs uh, faculty members who will be uh, attending our next session. Uh, this is a good opportunity to announce uh, that the third and last session in this mini series is uh, uh, on the title is New Regional Configuration, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf, Sta the Gulf States and the Palestinians. This will take place next week, November 4th, and you're all uh, mostly uh, uh, warmly invited to attend. Uh, it's also the appropriate moment to thank Crystal Felcaro Hibbs, uh, IIP's program assistant uh, for her tireless efforts in organizing this mini conference. So as I said, today's session is on the impact on the regional and international powers in the Middle East, Turkey, Iran, Russia, and the US. Uh, the moderator is my colleague and partner, Professor Itai Senet, and allow me to introduce him. Itai uh, received his PhD from the University of Rochester, and he has been uh, for a lengthy period uh, with the University of Washington in, in St. Louis, uh, where he served between uh, 2001 and 13 as the director of the Center for New Con Institutional and Social Sciences, CNISS. He also served uh, there as a full-time chair uh, of the social science department between 2004 and 7, before returning to Israel. His main interests are the comparative study of institutions, game theory, applied mathematical modeling, and public policy. First book, The Political Institution of Private Property, was published by Cambridge University Press. Second book, Political Bargaining, Theory, Practice, and Process, co-authored with Gidon Doron. Um, and he published numerous articles, co-edited, co-authored many others. Most recently, he published his fifth book, an edited volume with Sebastian Galliani, entitled Economic Institutions, Rights, Growth, and Sustainability. Um, the Legacy of uh, Douglas North. Since he returned to Israel, and this will be my final note, he served as chair of the Department of Public Policy. He's the founding head of the School of Social and Policy Studies, 
and the founding head of the Boris Mintz Institute for Strategic Policy Solution to Global Challenges, which is um, particularly co-sponsoring this uh, present event. As of August 20, he was appointed Dean of the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences. Uh, he's a regular and popular lecturer on many international venues uh, with recent lectures focusing on the current interest in the transition to renewable energy, mostly relating to current Middle Eastern politics. This is Itai. I now uh, will give the mic to Itai, who will take over and run the session. Itai, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Eli. I should uh, not uh, miss the opportunity to uh, thank uh, Crystal and myself, um, who has done uh, so much work to put all of this together. And of course, to Eli Reches, we have been working together, Eli and myself, uh, very hard to bring the uh, uh, relationships between uh, uh, Northwest and Tel Aviv University to the next level. Uh, we have uh, many plans and as we tend to do, we have every reason, every uh, intention to uh, make them happen. Um, turning to the event of today, uh, as Ellie mentioned briefly earlier, the uh, Afghan um, uh, crisis has uh, reached a new um, stage and it certainly deserves our attention. And uh, the way we run it, uh, I have, uh, asked permission and have been granted permission to change a little bit the order of speakers is uh, I think we will uh, start with a discussion of how this new stage of the Afghan uh, crisis, which has been in crisis for uh, many, many decades and probably is going to stay in crisis for many decades to come, uh, how it uh, reshapes um, uh, a relationship between uh, uh, the United States and Iran. And uh, then we'll turn to a discussion of uh, the role of Turkey, which is becoming a critical player in the region. And, um, uh, and uh, we will conclude with a discussion of how it all looks uh, from the perspective of the uh, Middle East. So if you want to <clears throat> uh, uh, discuss uh, US-Iranian uh, uh, relationship, uh, we probably have one of the most uh, prominent uh, uh, experts on the topic, Abbas Milani. Abbas Milani is the director of the Iranian studies at, uh, the, uh, of the uh, uh, Hoover uh, and research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, he is uh, um, Hamid Christina Movedam, director of Iranian studies at Stanford University. He has, uh, he's, one of, he's been one of the uh, founding uh, uh, co-directors of the Iran Democracy Project and a research fellow at the Hoover Institutions. And uh, he is one of the most uh, prominent experts on uh, the uh, US-Iran relationship with a very important book published uh, in 2010 on uh, the topic until 1986, he taught at the Tehran University, the Faculty of Law and Political Science, where he was also the member of the Board of Directors of the University's Center on International Relations. After moving to the United States, he was for 14 years a chair of the Political Science Department at the Notre Dame de Namur University. And uh, for eight years, he was visiting research fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, Middle East center. Uh, uh, definitely one of the prominent experts on the US-Iran relations. And uh, my question to uh, you, um, uh, Abbas, is to what extent, if at all, uh, the Afghan, the new stage of the Afghan crisis affects the US Iran relations, and I would like to uh, ask you to expand a little bit because there is so much going on right now um, with the uh, U.S.-Iran relations that it probably uh, is fitting uh, that we try to put 
the conflict in, in Afghanistan uh, and its uh, connection to the US-Iran relations, but go beyond that and discuss um, uh, your sense of what is going on and how these relationships are reshaping themselves. Thank you very much uh, for your very kind uh, and generous introduction and for the invitation to this very uh, august uh, gathering. Uh, it is always a pleasure to talk with uh, uh, colleagues from Israel and learn from them. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure this will be uh, yet another occasion. Uh, I think uh, the uh, Afghan crisis or fiasco, whatever you want to call it, uh, particularly the way it uh, was rolled out, uh, the way the U.S. withdrew, uh, has given the Iranian regime uh, propaganda bonanza. Uh, and if you look at it historically, uh, the U.S. has given Iran uh, gifts in Afghanistan and in Iraq over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, the U.S. took out the Taliban, which were a very serious uh, foes of Iran. They were on the verge of going to war. Uh, the invasion of Afghanistan took out the Taliban. Uh, the invasion of Iraq took out Iran's another, this regime's another contender of, uh, for regional dominance, uh, Saddam Hussein. And then <clears throat> they basically left both of those places uh, open to Iran's influence peddling. Uh, and influence uh, augmenting. Um, so Iran, which was an enemy of the Taliban, uh, began to see as the Taliban as a potential tool to use against the United States. Uh, Iran that saw Al-Qaeda as a major foe, Al-Qaeda uh, form of uh, Sunni radicalism that basically she's, sees Shiism as a form of heresy. Uh, even Al-Qaeda, Iranian regime decided it could use as an instrument. It housed some of the Al-Qaeda uh, leaders in Iran. It gave them protection for several years. And it did the same thing in uh, Iraq. Uh, the U.S. took out Saddam Hussein and left Iran an essentially open field to cultivate and expand its influence. Now, I think uh, this is happening at in my view, a very historic juncture. Uh, in Iran, Mr. Khamenei, who has the disproportionate share of power and has had it for 35 years, uh, has been very keen uh, for many years to re-pivot Iran's foreign policy away from the West in general, uh, and certainly away from the United States, which he considers to be the greatest of Satan's, uh, uh, and towards Asia. Uh, Asian pivot has been his essential strategic goal for many, many years. And his animosity towards the U.S. Pre uh, predates the time that he became a uh, supreme leader. It even predates the Islamic Republic. Uh, many people might not know that Khamenei has translated for of Sayyid Quds, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's chief theorist, uh, narratives on modernity, which are uh, unblemished in terms of their anti-Americanism and seeing America as the embodiment of this conspiracy against Islam, seeing America uh, as a co-conspirator with Israel to essentially undermine uh, not just Iran, but Islam, he sees, as Sayyid Abut did, the entire U.S.-Israeli alliance as a continuation of the crusade, and I'm almost verbatim quoting him, to derail the rise of Islam. And Khamenei believes uh, that we are at the moment where Islam is about to make a very important rise. So this re-pivot towards uh, uh, Asia uh, has been happening uh, to the detriment of uh, any possibility of uh, re-engagement with Europe or certainly with the United States. Uh, the Iranian regime sees and has used the Afghan exit 
uh, as proof positive that what Khamenei has been saying about America is true. One, that America is in decline. Two, that America cannot be trusted. Uh, they keep pointing to American allies, whether it is uh, the Afghan uh, um, generals or the Afghan government. They, uh, Khamenei and his rather substantial uh, propaganda apparatus have been focusing on this view and on the view that uh, the American exit from Afghanistan is one uh, more part of the success of Khamenei's strategy, which is to throw America out of the Middle East. Uh, if America, by all accounts, is thinking about a kind of a strategic withdrawal from the Middle East, a strategic re realignment, a strategic rethinking of energy sources, Khamenei has been talking about this not as a rethink of, rethinking of American priorities, but as a result of his success, his success in throwing Americans out of Lebanon, throwing them out of uh, Afghanistan, now throwing them out of uh, the Middle East. So the, the, uh, the optics as well as uh, the uh, affinities that they have developed, the regime had developed in spite of their secular uh, and in spite of the sectarian divide with the Taliban uh, has given them a temporary uh, sense of victory. That this has strengthened their hand, it has weakened the United States, and it has weakened uh, Israel as an ally of the United States. But I think that is a, a very superficial reading of the situation. I, I think that the uh, Afghan situation is not going to be in the long run in the benefit of the Iranian regime because the Afghan uh, Taliban are as stringent in their belief that they are the embodiment of pure Islam as the Iranian regime is in its articulation. Uh, in Afghanistan, we have the problem of the ISIS of Khorasan. Uh, Khorasan is a name uh, of a region that covers all the way from Central Asia, parts of Afghanistan, parts of Iran. Uh, and in fact, there is an Iranian um, area called Khorasan. And uh, there is a whole narrative about how the rise of a black flag movement from Khorasan is going to destroy all the enemies of Islam and end up in Jerusalem. Uh, this, ironically, this story based on a, or on a, on a hadith, on a, one of the stories attributed to the, pro, uh, to the prophet, that a movement of my followers who wear black, uh, who have a black flag, uh, will start in Khorasan and go all the way to Jerusalem and begin the end of history and the rise of Islam. Now, both Iran and ISIS claim to represent that black uh, movement, black flag movement. Khamenei for the Shiites of Iran is the Sayyid Khorasani. ISIS is uh, the ISIS of Khorasan. So possibilities of tension between Iran and Afghanistan, in spite of this sense of uh, declared victory, uh, I think remains uh, very, very strong. So uh, in Lebanon, in Iraq, uh, in Syria, I think Iranian uh, proxies are in as much of a decline as they have been in recent years. And their hope that they are going to solve their economic problems uh, and their political problem by relying on Russia uh, for uh, deterrence and on China for economic relief, I think has turned out to be a false hope. China has many more uh, balls in the air. China deals much more with Saudi Arabia, with United Arab Emirates, Iraq, Oman, than it does with Iran. And China clearly is hedging its bet in trying to re make this re-pivot. Uh, if China decides to make the re-pivot, then I think we're looking at a very interesting new landscape in the Middle East. Thank you very much, Abbas, for this very interesting uh, 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 set of remarks. Um, I will uh, come back to you uh, later on because I want to uh, follow up on 
the uh, exact starting point of, you know, how does the United States deal with all of this and how it may deal with all of this. But we will now uh, turn to uh, uh, Sonia Chapti, Chapti uh, uh, and I uh, uh, apologize for pronouncing the name the best I can. You're pretty close. Uh, okay. so, so, so I'll use Sonia just to be at the safe side, on the safe side. Um, and um, for those of us who live in the Middle East, and uh, Eyal and I do, uh, we know very well the significance of uh, Turkey as a major player. I think that in some corners of the world, this uh, prominence of uh, Erdogan and Turkey uh, is sometimes uh, overlooked or not uh, given the uh, full attention it deserves. And um, uh, uh, Sonar is, uh, is uh, clearly one of the uh, big experts on the uh, issue. He has uh, gotten his doctoral uh, dissertation in history from Yale University on Turkish nationalism, which is kind of the, it's the center of the Erdogan uh, agenda. Uh, he has taught courses at Yale, Princeton, Georgetown, Smith College, um, has uh, uh, been uh, uh, has uh, been the chair of the Turkey Advanced Area Studies Program at the State Department for Services Institute, and he's the author of the Rise of Turkey, the 21st Century First Muslim Power, the New Sultan Adwan, and uh, the Crisis of Modern Turkey, and Erdogan Empire Turkey and the Politics of the Middle East. So he has been studying and writing about this very interesting and prominent player in the Middle East for some time now. And the question for you, given the tensions and the on again, off again relations of the United States with Turkey with so many different facets, the question is uh, how does a, a retreat from Afghanistan uh, affect Turkey's hegemonic influence in uh, uh, the Afghanistan and the complex world of the multi uh, uh, of the Muslim majority nations around them. Um, as uh, Abbas mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Af Afghanistan is just one center. Then you have Iran, but Erdogan, of course, argues that he is the real uh, savior right now of the Middle East in his own ways. So. Uh, please make sense of this new alignment in our region. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Itai. I'll do my best. I also wanted to join Abbas in thanking the organizers, both Northwestern and Tel Aviv University, and Ali and Kirstel will be doing so much work to get us together. And uh, of course, very important discussion. So uh, kind of looking at Turkish interests in Afghanistan and how it fits into the foreign policy agenda and the domestic agenda of Turkish President Erdogan. Uh, like in most uh, other issues, I think Turkey's interest in Afghanistan is driven by Erdogan-related factors and Turkish foreign policy-related factors. They're, they're not always the same, though they overlap. Uh, so the Erdogan part of it, of course, is that uh, Turkish President Erdogan is now uh, doing his best uh, to win the, the heart of uh, U.S. President Biden. This is closely linked to Erdogan's troubles at home. Uh, Erdogan delivered uh, one or rather nationwide elections on a platform of strong economic growth for nearly 15 years. He built a base that loves him, but uh, the base is now peeling away because Turkey's economy went into recession in 2015, 2018, sorry, for the first time under Erdogan. It's the main reason why his candidates lost mayoral elections the following year in 2019 in Istanbul, Ankara, and other big cities. The economy has exited recession, but it's only showing signs of slow growth. Inflation is now nearly 20%, the highest it has been since Erdogan came to power in, as prime minister in 2003. Unemployment is rising and macro indicators don't look very good. So um, Turkey is a resource poor country and it needs financial inflows to grow. And Erdogan knows that he needs to therefore restore markets confidence in Turkey for the economy to turn around, enter his relationship with Biden. Uh, he's been very patient with Biden, that is Erdogan. It took Biden over three months after uh, he was elected to call Erdogan and 
When Biden called Erdogan, it wasn't to say, how are you? Can we have a meeting? It was to say, I'm going to recognize the Armenian genocide. And Erdogan's reaction was, thank you so much for calling me. Can we have a meeting? Uh, he's very eager to create a narrative of good ties with the US president, because as we know, Turkey's east if you come from the west and west if you come from the, from the east, which means when markets make decisions, uh, whether or not they're going to put money into Turkey, they want to know that Turkey is okay, that it's not leaving the West and it's on good terms with the U.S. So Erdogan is now really intent on establishing a narrative of good ties with Biden, and he's eager to meet him. And it looks like uh, the uh, the two leaders meeting that was supposed to take place at G20 summit is now moved to uh, the climate summit in Glasgow. Where does Afghanistan fit into all of this? Uh, Erdogan realized early on that uh, Biden's uh, withdrawal plan from Afghanistan required uh, an, an ally to run the airport in Kabul. So uh, he volunteered uh, Turkey for this task. Uh, and this was quite important for Biden. I think that this would have been, uh, had the plan been implemented, Turkey running the airport, because Turkish military would have provided a lifeline between a uh, coalition uh, embassies in um, Kabul, including US and other NATO members and the outside world. If this plan had been implemented, it would have been a great uh, starter for the Erdogan-Biden relationship because it would have been an area of discussion and, and shared concern. Unfortunately for Erdogan, it didn't happen. The plan that is because the Taliban surprised everyone and took the airport and the city quite swiftly. So um, this would have been a great uh, starter for Erdogan-Biden relationship. And now I think what Erdogan is uh, looking for is maybe other ways to build uh, at Afghanistan still make it a building block of the his relationship with Biden. So yes, maybe Turkey is not going to run the airport, but it could do security for the airport because nobody's going to trust the Taliban to the airport security if uh, regular flights start out of Kabul. And in this regard, I think Turkey is paired up with Qatar. It's, uh, it's remaining sole ally in the Middle East. Uh, Qatar and Turkey are very close, uh, of course, uh, for a variety of reasons. And Qatar also is closer to the Taliban than probably most of the other regional powers, um, leaving Pakistan aside, of course. Um, and so I think uh, Turkey is now hoping that it will become the connective tissue between the Taliban and the outside world uh, via the airport, again, with the, an alliance with the Qataris. That's the, as I said, every driver, every issue in Turkish foreign policy these days could have two drivers, you know, one related to Erdogan's agenda and one related to the broader Turkish foreign policy concerns. So how about Turkish foreign policy in Afghanistan? I think, so I'm an historian of, uh, you know, late Ottoman Empire, early modern Turkey, as you heard from Itai. Uh, I have friends who often joke and say, so, you know, where does the Middle East end if you go from east from Turkey and west from Turkey? And I tell them that the Middle East ends when you go east from Turkey, if you come to a country where people like Turks again, that country is Afghanistan. Turkey has a lot of soft power in Afghanistan. Uh, going back to the, um, Establishment of the Afghan uh, kingdom, Ataturk and King Amanullah at the time got along really well. Actually, they, uh, the king visited Ataturk, um, supposedly to learn from the Turkish experience of westernization. But uh, the two countries have maintained very good ties. Um, they recognized each other early on. In fact, Afghanistan was one of the first countries to recognize Turkey in 1920, and Turkey did the same. So really solid ties and also kind of soft power in general that multiplied in the last two decades. Turkey sent troops to Afghanistan after 9-11, but these troops never fought. Uh, they built schools, they built hospitals, roads, did education projects and healthcare projects and built mosques. So I think uh, it has given Turkey even more soft power on the ground. So I actually thought that if there was not a security threat to Turkey's presence at the airport, Turkey would be an ideal country to run the airport because it's received well uh, by the Afghan public. But I think that effort has now been sidelined. It's also important to see what uh, Pakistan will do to help Turkey because Pakistan does have influence over the Taliban and Pakistan is one of Turkey's closest allies. But I think Erdogan is still very eager to find an area of cooperation in Kabul airport. And I believe that this is going to be one of the issues he'll discuss with Biden in Glasgow in a few days. There'll be some other issues, but I think uh, the administration here is also looking for ways um, to isolate conflict areas with Turkey from cooperation areas, uh, believing that conflict areas, issues of S-400 and U.S. cooperation with YPG won't be resolved. Uh, Turkey's purchase of S-400 missile defense system from Russia is a big issue also. Uh, so I think the administration is trying to find areas of cooperation and it's going to look at Afghanistan quite positively. 
I believe Turkey wants security, uh, intelligence assistance from the US if it wants to do uh, the airport security, of course, and maybe uh, help uh, start flights. Turkish Airlines will be an ideal partner. Uh, it has the, one of the largest networks in the world. They also serve really good food. Uh, so I think everybody would fly on them if Turkey was doing security. But with that, let me end up. I know there's a lot more to come back to. I just want to make sure we have enough time also for other colleagues to weigh in. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sona. Uh, this has been uh, remarkably uh, interesting and from an angle that I must admit was uh, uh, somewhat different than what we hear all the time. So thank you very much for letting uh, us with your uh, remark. Um, Professor Aziz is the, the vice uh, uh, rector of Tel Aviv University. Uh, is a highly recognized and thought after historians of uh, Syria. Um, he wrote uh, numerous books on Syria, Assad series at a crossroad uh, in 1999, Assad legacy, Syrian transition in 2000, Lebanon, the challenge of uh, independence in 2000, faces of Syria in 2003, commanding Syria, Bashar al-Assad first year in power in uh, 2006, the bidding Syria uh, in 2009 in Syria protest revolution, civil war uh, in 2014. So looking at this uh, record, uh, one would associate uh, Eyal with uh, uh, the expertise uh, over Syria. But uh, Ayal has uh, been speaking um, on different uh, outlets about uh, much broader issues in the Middle East and uh, recently has uh, uh, had several uh, discussions of uh, how the Middle East is reshaping itself. And um, I wanted to uh, ask Ayal to round this first round of questions with a straight question on the um, retreat, uh, as I prefer to call it rather than other names, uh, of the US from Kabul, um, there is this uh, really uh, high concern about uh, the Iranian uh, next step and uh, Iranian proxies, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, two organizations that Iran has been following quite closely um, as an expert of the region and Syria and Lebanon in particular. So I guess it's two questions in one. Uh, how do you see uh, the, the Iranian next move and enriching uh, uranium? And how do they uh, use the proxies, uh, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, as a leverage uh, to... Uh, uh, advance their interest as Abbas uh, suggested earlier. Well, good evening and thank you all for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, conference, this wonderful uh, panel. And uh, indeed, uh, um, I would like to address the, 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 the regional reactions coming to, to, of course, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, the, the regional reaction to, 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 to the American withdrawal, what Abbas called fiasco. Indeed, it was a fiasco. And uh, let me argue first that uh, when speaking about Arab perceptions or regional perceptions of Israel, why do Arab fear of Israel? Why do Arab respect Israeli strengths? It has to do with its military and economic strengths. It has to do with what uh, people think of its uh, nuclear capabilities, something Israel, uh, no Israeli official would comment about, of course, but it has to do also with the American support. When you ask, you know, and, 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 and you wonder, you know, why Sadat uh, signed an agreement with Israel, why Hafez al-Assad and later on Bashar was ready to, why, why, why? Part of the answer has to do with the uh, close relations Israel has with uh, the United States and with the strong support the Americans offer to Israel. So 
My argument is that it does matter when, when the reputation of America is being damaged, when America and the United States is not perceived as strong, it does affect Israel. But then we have to comment that it's not only Israel, because while now we speak about partnership. I mean, it's not only Israel, it's also the United Arab Emirates, it's also Bahrain, it's also Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's also Egypt and Jordan who are wonder about what America might or might not do in this region. So it's not Israel alone, and this is a dramatic change when we compare it to what happened, let's say, 20 or 30 years uh, ago. And by the way, I guess that some Arab countries are more worried about the role the United States is to play in the region than, than Israel. The other thing I would like to say is that when we look at the uh, reaction in the region, Iran, or at least Hezbollah, I follow Hezbollah uh, more closely. And at the same time, ISIS were very careful not to celebrate. They felt they had nothing to celebrate uh, when they saw what happened in, uh, in Iran, in Afghanistan and the um, victory of uh, the, the, the collapse of the previous regime in Afghanistan. ISIS, for obvious reason, ISIS doesn't consider anymore the Taliban as an ally, and indeed it conducted uh, some terrible terrorist attacks against the Taliban. It's still, of course, against Shiites, but it's now Shiites, Afghan Shiites, under the patronage of the Taliban government. And also Hezbollah, for the reasons uh, Abbas uh, mentioned, Taliban are not friends of, uh, of uh, Iran. On the other hand, we could see uh, some Sunni radical groups. I mean, Hamas, uh, uh, Islamic Jihad, some Sunni Arab group that were very happy with this uh, uh, so-called defeat or so-called Taliban victory and, and, and the link between Hamas, to a certain degree, Erdogan, but clearly Qatar and Taliban is quite... Uh, uh, clear to us, but it's the media level or organizations that are not state, because when we speak about Hezbollah, when we speak about Iran, those are states that know quite uh, well that it has nothing to do with, the image has nothing to do with reality, and the fiasco uh, doesn't show anything uh, when it comes to the American strength on the ground. And I think really that uh, what people wonder are not about what happened in Afghanistan and should have happened maybe 20 or 30 years ago. The American, from the first place, shouldn't have tried to do what they did in Afghanistan. This was their historical uh, uh, mis mistake and they should have disengaged from, Af from Afghanistan in 91 or 92, not in 2021. But, 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 but the issue is not about Afghanistan. The issue is about Iraq. The issue is about the, 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 the Middle East. And we are not speaking about Afghanistan. Only a week ago, the Iranians or pro-Iranian Shiite Iraqi militia launched an attack against an American base in Tanif. Now, let me remind you that uh, two years ago, such moves, such plans led to the assassination of Qasem Soleimani by the Americans. This time, no reactions from the Americans. I mean, an American base was attacked by the Iranians, okay, through proxies. No American, no any American reactions. And at the same time, the plans to disengage from Iraq, to withdraw also from Iraq, and the message we want to disengage from this region, we want to uh, have a dialogue with Bashar al-Assad. We prefer a deal with Iran rather than to engage in a conflict. This is the problematic message, and this is what encouraged, I guess, the uh, Iranians uh, to put some pressure on the Americans, I mean, okay, we can attack you and eventually we leave, uh, get out of Syria and then maybe also get out of um, 
Iraq, and this might be a great victory, although I want to, I, I, I guess the Iranians know that most Shiites in Iraq do not like Iran and would oppose uh, any Iranian effort to impose uh, itself on, on Iraq, but, but, but still Iran is being encouraged, no doubt about it. And as for the nuclear project, I myself don't, th- don't think that the Iranians are in a hurry. I mean, they did well. If they take a decision, they can do it in several weeks or months. So, you know, it's not a big deal to turn nuclear while, you know, because turning nuclear, it's mainly only to make it public while everybody knows that you have it already. So the issue is to make it public, not to have it. So why should they make it uh, public? Everybody knows, everybody are already uh, scared about uh, about Iran. I guess it's much better to get a deal to improve the economy, to continue with step by step and eventually get more presence and influence in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, and uh, becoming nuclear in the sense that announcing that we have, this can wait. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a a request here from uh, Ellie who has asked us to uh, say uh, uh, a word or two about Russia. So what I will do now is I will uh, turn back to the speakers and uh, ask uh, each one of you uh, very briefly to uh, suggest to us what we should be uh, on the outlook for. What is the trend or the characteristic or the particulars we need to look at as we try to understand the next month or years um, of uh, this uh, uh, region but if and to the extent you wish to do so, please uh, 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 reflect also or say a couple of words on uh, uh, the role of Russia as well. Uh, actually, uh, Abbas did mention Russia briefly, uh, Sona did too. So what should we look at and how Russia ties to it in any way? Abbas, uh, please, uh, we will start yes. with you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Iran has offered now in the last uh, few months two agreements, one to Russia, one to China. They're both 25-year agreements. We know something about the Chinese deal. It it is a remarkable deal. In a sense, it gives China a right of first uh, refusal for every major project in the next uh, 25 years with the promise that China will invest $400 billion in Iran. And they claim something similar has been offered to Russia. Uh, No draft of that agreement has been uh, divulged. So we don't know what's in that agreement. But Iran and Russia are very much working hand in hand, have been working hand in hand. Uh, But Afghanistan has actually brought a little bit of a rift between them. Uh, There was a conference that uh, Russia uh, organized uh, about uh, Afghanistan, and uh, Russia uh, unilaterally issued the statement at the end. Iran said we didn't, we weren't part of this agreement. It was uh, one of the open rifts uh, on Afghanistan that uh, you could see. You know, uh, everyone, not everyone, a lot of people talk about the coming Cold War with China the coming Cold War with China and Russia maybe as potential allies. Uh, I see a rising uh, tide of authoritarianism uh, that is uh, spearheaded by China. Uh, Russia is very much part of it. Uh, Iran is a junior partner. Erdogan is another partner. Uh, Hungary is another partner. India is inching ever closer to joining that brotherhood. And it's a brotherhood that is challenging fundamentally the international order as we've known it for uh, 150 years and is challenging liberal democracy as an ideal model. Uh, And if there is that Cold War coming, and I think there is, 
we are going to see repercussions in the Middle East. China is already signing deals uh, with Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Iraq. They've signed long-term deals with all of these countries. China has already invested more than $50 billion in Pakistan, uh, the country that is going to be very important in Afghanistan. China has an embassy in Afghanistan. China is working with Iran in trying to influence Afghanistan. And Iran's uh, uh, ability to influence Afghanistan is helped by the fact that the gentleman who now leads the Quds Brigade Mr. Ghani began his uh, work in the Quds Brigade uh, by organizing uh, Afghan uh, rebels, by having ties with Ahmad Masood, by having ties with the Northern Alliance. Uh, he led the Fatimiyun Brigade in Syria, uh, where they took thousands of Afghan Shiites and sent them uh, to fight uh, on behalf of the Iranian uh, regime in def uh, defense of Saddam Hussein. Uh, in defense of Assad, a Freudian slip. Uh, so all of this, to me, uh, are the trend lines. Uh, a rising China, more assertive China, uh, a rising Russia, and the uh, countries in the Middle East looking for an alternative ally other than the United States, who they see as trying to disengage from the Middle East because it no longer needs uh, oil, and essential is interest, essential interest in the Middle East seems to be the continued support for Israel. Thank you so much, uh, Abbas. Uh, Sona, could you uh, give uh, your uh, vision of what should we be looking for or after? After the withdrawal, you mean, or between Turkey and Russia, or? Three years from now. Oh. One year from now, several months. What should we be looking at? Well, what so, should uh, we be looking at? Again, looking at this from the perspective of uh, obviously uh, Turkish politics, I think the biggest concern in Ankara is a fresh flow of refugees. Turkey has hosted uh, about 4 million Syrian refugees, giving them a really warm welcome. Uh, and uh, that welcome is now wearing thin though. And that's a very big number in Turkey. Turkey's population is 84 million people. So 4 million refugees that constitutes nearly a five-person addition to Turkey's population, it'd be the cool enough uh, 17 million refugees coming to the U.S. in a decade. So just imagine the societal pressures, but Turkey's public really deserves a credit for extending a very welcome, welcome to Syrians. But that welcome is now wearing thin because the economy is not doing well. Anti-refugee sentiments are rising. In fact, uh, a lot of the opposition parties have taken on the refugee issue to target uh, President Erdogan and his party. So I think if there was a fresh flow of refugees, likely as a result of Taliban brutality uh, targeting Shia minorities and others and, or urban people, uh, of course, I think Iran would be very smart to transfer these refugees the moment they arrive uh, from the Iranian Afghani border to the Iranian Turkish border, uh, drop them off. And of course, Turkey's border will be overwhelmed. But Turkey is not building a wall uh, along the border. Uh, with Iran, it already has a wall along the border with Syria to prevent refugees crossing. But the Turkish-Iranian border is quite rugged and mountainous, uh, thousands of feet high. So I wouldn't say that the border wall will do a, an excellent job in preventing refugee flow. So I would say the most imminent kind of a issue that I would flag for Afghanistan, Afghanistan from, from the Turkish perspective is uh, potential of refugees. The second issue I would look at is uh, out of this Erdogan-Biden meeting in Glasgow, maybe Turkey and U.S. agreeing with U.S. support that Turkey should do airport security and Turkish Airlines then could start uh, uh, regular flights, charter flights to, uh, to Kabul airport. It could establish Turkey as the connective tissue, uh, uh, of course, together with Qatar, between the outside world and the Taliban. And that could give Turkey leverage in the eyes of Biden and others. And because if they want to uh, reach out to Taliban and have it moderate its behavior, Turkey could be a partner. Since you also mentioned Russia, I don't think uh, Afghanistan is necessarily an area of Turkish-Russian competition or overlap, um, though there are, of course, Turkic peoples living in Afghanistan, such as Uzbeks and Turkmens, and they speak languages closer to Turkish. So that's a part of the soft power I was mentioning earlier when I said Afghanistan is a country Turkey is like. And I think uh, part of it is driven by 
a large group of Turkic na nations, Uzbeks and, and Turkmens, but I don't see Turkish-Russia competition or confrontation uh, or overlap in Afghanistan. I think in Syria, it's a different business. In Libya and in South Caucasus, where Turkey and Afghanistan have power sharing, Turkey and Russia, sorry, have power sharing deals, but I don't think this is extended to Afghanistan yet. Thank you so much, uh, Sonar. And uh, we will now uh, uh, turn to uh, Eyal and, uh, um, you know, you yeah. see vision from within. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, you know, we speak, we often speak about the American disengagement from the region, but it seems that, you know, the Americans want to disengage, but it forces itself upon the Americans and they are forced to stay. They are forced to stay because they don't have an alternative. They don't have, as far as, you know, the region is concerned. I mean, look at Syria, a ruined country. Russia is a poor state. Russia is a poor state, have no money to invest in Syria. Iran is a poor state. Uh, Iran and Russia cannot take care of their own citizens. So what can they offer to the Syrians? I mean, the Iranian can send Shiites to fight on the battleground. The, the, the Russian can send some aircrafts, but it's always some aircraft, you know. Even when we speak about the comeback of Russia, the United States have now a military presence that is much bigger than the United the, the, than the than the Russians. I mean, uh, um, everybody knows that that when you need uh, economic support, you go to the Americans, not to the Russians. And the Chinese, of course, they will not invest even one penny if they will not get a return. It's not the Russians, it's not the Americans that give you money uh, to promote their interest. I mean, that's why you don't see even one Johan being invested in Syria by the Iranian, by the Chinese. It's only for uh, to, to get something in return. And China, we know, wants a stability because it will it would affect its internal security, which I don't know if it's too stable. Uh, now, uh, uh, nowadays, so all, all in all, I don't see any big changes. Nevertheless, I, I, I think it's uh, interesting to follow events in Iraq. Iraq is a central country. Uh, uh, um, Abbas rightly mentioned that you know the American occupation uh, uh, opened the door in front of the Iranian to the. Uh, uh, Arab world, a door which was kept closed by the by Saddam Hussein on all by, by all Iraqi rulers before him, uh, uh, but the Americans are determined to disengage from this region. The American, uh, the, the Iraqis will try to uh, the, the Iranian, sorry, will try to take control over Iraq, and there is a Iraq is not Afghanistan. No, it's a state. And there are the Kurds there, and the Sunnis are there, and most Shiites don't like Iran. I think we'll have a fight, a very interesting fight. Most Arabs do not want any, Amer any Iranian presence. So one question is what might happen in, um, in Iraq uh, as a point of departure for other regions in, 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 in the Middle East. And then what might happen with, with the deal, with the nuclear deal, whether we are to reach a deal and then the situation will be stabilized for some time because theoretically, you know, there is no deal. Americans and Israelis are, are launching a military attack. It can create a chaos. I don't know what will, might be the repercussions for, for, for such a move, but if it's not the case, there is an agreement. So. What we'll see is more of, um, of the same, you know, fear of Iran, um, efforts to contain Iran, uh, but it would be more of the same. Okay, thank you so much uh, to all of you. We are uh, three minutes uh, before the end of the uh, webinar. Um, and uh, I don't see questions on the uh, tab. So, <clears throat> If um, uh, any one of you wants to say one final word, um, 
I would be uh, 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 grateful for uh, final remarks. Uh, and probably we go by the same order, final remarks by Abbas, final remark by Asona, and final remark by Eyal. So Abbas, could you uh, uh, make some final comments on the situation? Please. The tension I was referred to, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I want to make a, a, a closing comment on uh, this the tension between Iran and uh, uh, Arabs and uh, anti-Iranian uh, sentiments amongst not just in Iraq, but in the rest of the region as well. I watched an interview by Nasrullah, uh, who is the most proxy uh, of the proxies of Iran. As he said, they were created by Iran. They have been helped by Iran. And he said, our Arab brothers tell us, uh, why do you accept money from the uh, Persians? And we tell them, we don't accept money from the Persians. This government is the government of Sayyids and Sayyids of our descendants of the prophet and thus the Arabs. Iran is now ruled by an Arab. To make that argument shows the level of tension not just in Iraq, but in Lebanon and other countries in the region who are, I think, afraid of what they see, the over aggressiveness of the Iranian regime in the guise of Shiism. But uh, many Arabs see it not as a Shiite uh, arch necessarily, but as a Persian arch against the Arabs. Uh, Abbas, we do have a question that comes from the floor that you'd be the best expert to answer. And that is, how do you think uh, 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 the United States should play its hand against Iran after you have said everything that you have said? Uh, I, I think the United States needs to develop a strategy on Iran. The United States does not have a strategy on Iran and they go from one tactic to another. And it has been a disaster in virtually every administration. Uh, I think Richard Nixon might have been the last US president who actually had a vision about where Iran stands in that region. The United States need to develop an idea. And I think the idea I would suggest is that the future of Iran is not with this regime. The future of Iran is with the Iranian people who are increasingly more secular increasingly more democratic, increasingly more averse to authoritarianism. That is the natural ally of the West. That Iran is a natural ally of Israel. And that uh, Iran is a very potent force to stand up to religious radicalism. That is, I think, uh, the enemy of all, including the United States. Um. Thank you so much. This was uh, uh, very clear and uh, 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 very enlightening. Um, Sona, could you make your final remarks, please? Sure. Very quickly, I would say everyone should watch out for the outcome of the uh, Biden-Erdogan meeting in Scotland in the next few days. If, uh, one of the news stories could be that Turkey will agree to do security for the airport. I think Turkey is asking for quite a bit of financial and uh, intelligence assistance from the US to do it. And let's see uh, if they have a, a middle point where they meet. If that news story is that Turkey is doing uh, security for the airport and running uh, therefore flights to Istanbul, this would be quite a big uh, news because it, Erdogan will have finally found uh, one area of cooperation with Biden. Uh, in other words, uh, the, what he's looking for, of course, is building some rapport with him. So that'd be an interesting new story uh, to follow and we'll see if that happens in Scotland. Uh, last but not least, uh, and, and also, um, you know, kind of a um, question from the floor, if we can call it that way. You know, I've heard you before express these views, you know, the one who quite um, threatening on the level to which Iran has already advanced toward nuclear uh, force. Uh, but how, uh, you know, the final question uh, uh, to your final remark, how does uh, all of this affect Israel? Are you worried about, you know, do you think that Israel is retreating or is 
um, uh, suffering, its status in the Middle East is suffering from all of this, or not so much? You said something about everything is going to uh, be pretty much uh, uh, the same. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, we see strong advances from Iran, threatening Iran. Iran is definitely the, probably the ultimate enemy of Israel right now. Uh, how is Israel affected by all this? Well, you know, militarily, Israel is stronger as it was never been uh, before since it was established economically. I mean, when we speak about the Abraham Accords, the relation that were established between Israel and many of the Arab countries, yes, there is the Iranian threat. I myself believe that the real challenge is a domestic challenge. The threat is from within when it comes to Israeli relations with the Palestinians. This is a very significant challenge and uh, the challenges from within, uh, inside Israel, relations between uh, Israeli Arabs or uh, Palestinians who are citizens of Israel and Jews, between different uh, Jewish groups. This is, uh, this is the big uh, challenge. Uh, Abbas mentioned authoritarianism. We uh, you know, uh, a long era of 12 years came to an end when Netanyahu uh, left with some problems the office of the prime minister. So I think the challenges are from within and uh, those will dictate the future of Israel. Those challenges, the way we deal with them, not necessarily the, Amer the, the, the Iranian threat. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Eli, for this uh, very uh, uh, significant uh, effort. Uh, thank you uh, all for uh, uh, coming. And I, I believe I'll let uh, Eli say a few words about the next session, please. Um, well, I, I, want, I would like to join Ita in thanking our speakers. I think uh, you did a great job in, in covering uh, so many issues over, over such a short period of time. This was very illuminating um, commentary. Uh, and again, uh, thank you. Um, Eyal, you mentioned the Palestinians. And yes, indeed, uh, our next session, last in, last in the series, will be next week, where we'll deal with the new configuration in the Middle East. We want to look at the uh, Abraham Accord, the relations with Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, and the Palestinians. Uh, you see the slide on uh, uh, being screened um, with the participants that we have. No need to repeat that. Um, again, I want to thank everybody. And just one last remark. Uh, shortly, within a day or two, uh, or maybe more, uh, we'll have uh, the record, the recording uh, online on our website and on YouTube. So. Anyone who hasn't had a chance to uh, watch it um, live can uh, follow it um, in our uh, media channel. So thanks, everybody. I look forward to further such collaborations. And good day, good night, good evening, whatever it is to everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.